Okay, recording. Okay. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Jackie Jacob, as you can see from the first slide. Hopefully, you can see my slides. If you can't see my slides, um, please let me know. Um, I work at the University of Kentucky. I'm a poultry specialist, but I also um, I'm also the uh, coordinator for the community of practice, they call them, on e-extension, which is the electronic version of the uh, cooperative extension service. And we have a community of practice for small and backyard uh, chickens. And as part of that, we organize um, monthly webinars. I'm not the only one who does present. Um, there are others who do present as well. Uh, but this month is my turn, and um, my topic for today is raising your own meat chickens. This uh, webinar is being recorded and uh, will be available um, later tonight. Um, all of our um, webinars are recorded and put up, and if you go to, uh, let's see if I can talk and type, um, we have a Oops. We have a website, uh, poultryextension.org, which has lots of articles. It has um, all the recordings from past webinars, lets you know when the upcoming webinars are. It also has the new Ask Extension um, link there as well. Uh, we also have a uh, Facebook page. Um, Oops. Oh, I can't remember what it is. I'll have to think of it later. Um, you can get to the Facebook page from our poultry extension. So let's get started. We have people from various places. Um, the way this usually works is there's usually two of us with me hosting and somebody else speaking, but um, this time it's just me. So I will try and monitor the question and answer section and the chat box. It's a little difficult. I only have one screen since I'm working from home and uh, I don't always see the questions that come up, but I will try and monitor those. If the question is pertinent to what I'm talking about at that time, I will answer it then and there. Uh, if it is um, something that's unrelated to what I'm talking about, I'll save it for the end. So um, we'll get started since it's already uh, 3.03. So as I said, the talk is on raising your own meat chickens. And um, in case you didn't know, there are egg chickens and there are meat chickens. Um, there are also dual purpose that are good at both, but not as good as the, the meat chickens or as good as the egg chickens. Come on. Okay, before you even start to think about raising your own uh, meat chickens, there are several things that you absolutely must consider. The first is the purpose. So are you just intending to feed your own family or are you going to feed, you know, maybe some neighbors if there's, you know, extras or uh, extended family per se, or are you going to sell to supplement your income or are you going to sell it as a main source of income? So. Uh, we do work with small and backyard flocks, so not just backyards. We do work with small commercial people who are looking at, um, you know, meat as a source of income for the farm. The next is how are you going to get them processed? And um, this is the one step that can particularly limit your ability to sell um, chicken uh, and it varies very much state to state. So uh, for example, Kentucky where I am, state regulations require that the meat for sale be processed in a USDA inspected facility in that it has an on-site uh, inspector there that checks each and every chicken that is being processed or um, just an inspected facility with no on-site inspector 
Um, so for example, in Kentucky, we have uh, a mobile processing facility that's not you know, overly mobile, but um, it can move to different docking stations and the facility itself is inspected. Um, it gets swabbed regularly for bacteria um, and it is a uh, you know, self-processing facility. The person who takes, who, who does the processing needs to have a HACCP certification, hazard analysis critical control points. Uh, they have to be HACCP certified uh, in order to um, use the facility. Um, and those are the only ways that you can sell chicken in Kentucky in most locations. So you cannot process chickens in your backyard and sell it to a grocery store or uh, a restaurant or uh, even legally to your neighbors. Um, our problem here in Kentucky is that we have, uh, I think we have two state USDA inspected facilities left, um, one in Eastern Kentucky and one in uh, Central Kentucky, um, and they only work part of the year. And um, we do have one, that we have the mobile processing facility and I think we have one Amish who is state inspected. Um, so make sure that you know your state regulations and we have people here from various uh, different states so that um, you need to know that you know you can sell what you're processing if that is your desire you know to make money you need to know that you can sell it also if you are um you know even just making it for yourself and you want somebody where you know somewhere where you can custom get your chicken um, processed there are you know not all that many processing facilities different areas have different um regulations so for example, um, Vermont, we don't have anybody here from Vermont, but I do know that Vermont does have a mobile processing facility that you can take to the farm and process on farm. You don't need a docking station like we do here. That is a environmental regulation that we have that requires the docking station. So you need to think about your, the uh, FDA, USDA, and um, health board and uh, environmental regulations, all of which will affect your ability to process and sell uh, chicken. So um, big point there in trying to start, you know, raising your own meat chickens. It's for your backyard, not a problem. You just have to process it yourself. Come on. So you can either locate a poultry processing facility or set up to process yourself. Um, when I was a child, well, teenager, I guess, uh, we used to process our own chickens in our backyard. It can be done. Of course, we had a big backyard, but um, we always processed our own chickens. So uh, there are, um, uh, what do you call it, the fact sheets online um, for the processing yourself. Uh, University of Kentucky has one. Um, many different states have them. Um, if you don't, go to the uh, poultryextension.org and um, there is something there, I think, on processing uh, of chickens. Uh, there is also a webinar that we did a couple of months ago on, um, processing chickens message. Okay, in Florida, there is a small poultry and egg sales certificate, which allows the sales of less than 30 dozen eggs per week and less than 18,000 dressed birds. For additional information, contact Joe Walter. So if you're in Florida, um, contact there. In Michigan, USDA only. They have one that, I'm, that, Matt, that Matt's aware of and they're looking at poultry growers exemption. Um, there, 
uh, there are national exemptions, but for example, Kentucky does not honor the exemptions um, where you don't have to be in a processed facility. We require it. So just because it's a national law does not mean that the state, you know, the state can override it. So make sure that you are familiar with the regulations specific to uh, your state. So not all exemptions at a national level are honored on a state level. So um, watch out for, for that. So, um, so if you are going to um, sell your product, you know, you found a processing facility, um, most of them are very expensive. So you have to look at that too. Um, make sure you have a market for the product that you're going to be able to produce at a price that will allow you to make a reasonable income. And um, if you're selling to some restaurants that want, um, you know, locally grown, they will sometimes work with farmers to make sure that, that the farmer is making a reasonable income, um, but not all are willing to pay the price because uh, it's going to be higher than commercial chicken. Uh, some of them are not willing to pay that, that extra price. So before you start producing anything, make sure you have a processing facility and that you can raise at an income that is not going to um, cost you too much. Sorry, my cat's bothering me. Okay. Uh, in terms of selling, I think a local seller stopped with chickens kept up with beef and pork because the processing cost per chicken was too high for the market value of chicken. Yes, that, that happens a lot. And I do see um, like here in Kentucky, we used to have more processing facilities. Uh, Marksbury was a big uh, processing facility. They stopped their chicken, uh, stopped their poultry period and um, only do beef and pork. So, um, they, they obviously themselves were not making enough money uh, processing the chicken because they have to, uh, they do it mostly by hand. And so they were not making enough money. So make sure that you um, can produce for the market that you have. So also before you start, you have to answer the question of what type of chicken you want to grow. And you have a number of different options. And um, a lot of it will, you know, your market will depend on sometimes on what type of chicken you're raising and what type of production system you're using. So, for example, the fastest growing chicken is a Cornish cross based chicken, it is a hybrid, um, it's a dead end cross, so you can't cross Cornish you know, they call them broilers. You can't cross a broiler and continue the line. You constantly have to buy new chicks. Just like uh, the corn, if you're familiar with some of the hybrid corns, you can't get your own seed and grow it again. You don't get the same thing. It is a hybrid cross between uh, multiple lines. There is no hormones involved. It's just that they grow very fast. It's, all, it's genetics and nutrition. Um, and so if you go with the, the broiler or Cornish cross-based chicken, it will grow the fastest and it will have the highest feed efficiency. So depending on your market uh, size, how, you know, how big you want to grow the, the chicken to, um, it can be ready to process in five to eight weeks. Um, Again, you can, if you're, if you're using it totally inside and you're selling, for example, a Cornish type chicken, the little Cornish hens that you see, um, they can be ready in three and four weeks if you want to go that small. Um, if you are raising them totally indoors, um, you know, the type of size of chicken that most people want is ready in like six weeks. If you raise them outdoors a little bit, then that's going to slow them down and you might have to go the full eight weeks. Uh, if you want to cut up chicken, boneless chicken or things like that, you're going to go to the eight weeks uh, as well. Uh, you can also, there are very many um, 
dual purpose breeds that are available. Um, for example, in our research here at the university, uh, we have a line of Bar Plymouth Rocks, a line of Rhode Island Reds and um, Black Osterlorps, and we do cross the Bard Rocks and the um, Rhode Island Reds to make the Black Sex Links. Um, we keep them now mostly for uh, embryology in the classroom to have something that's not white when it, or yellow when it hatches out. But um, they can be raised with the males for meat and the eggs, the hens for eggs. Um, they take a minimum of 12 weeks to get uh, to any size weight. These uh, carcasses here are um, 12 weeks old. Um, so you can see the, that they don't have as quite as much meat as the, the broiler cross, but they do have a fair amount um, in there, but their feed efficiency is really bad. So unless you can get a really good um, rate, you know, a price for them, then um, it's going to be hard to make any, um, things work. must keep these birds current or the mortality will be much too high. What do you mean by current? Joe, I'm not sure the, of the statement. Um, we did not, we, when we raised these birds, we did not have very much uh, mortality with uh, either type of bird. Okay, now you can also get, uh, there is a movement among uh, breeders to get a slower growing um, chicken that's faster than the dual purpose breeds, but not quite as fast as the uh, Cornish cross. Um, they also are uh, bred for being raised, being able to raise them outside. So one of them is the, um, the Red Ranger. That was the one that we looked at in our study, but um, there are others that are becoming available these days. Um, Hubbard has come up with a new bird that is slower. There is a movement among some of the um, restaurants and grocery stores to go to a slower chicken um, so that it takes, you know, eight to 10 weeks instead of the five to eight weeks. Um, it has, you know, a reasonable amount of meat on it, grows reasonably well. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. With the Cornish, yes, you have to harvest at an early age or the, the mortality will be too high, yes. You can't take them too long or they'll have leg problems and mortality problems. So the, um, the Red Ranger, again, eight to 10 weeks, not quite as uh, efficient uh, in utilizing the food as the, the cross, but it's better than the dual purpose type chickens. So we did a study here on uh, campus uh, at Kentucky, and we looked at um, the Cornish cross male, Cornish cross female, Red Rangers. Uh, I think they were females, that's all we could get. No, males, we couldn't get females. The Black Osterlorps, uh, Rhode Island Red, and Bard Rocks were mixed sex. We did not um, sex them. We hatched them out and, and uh, ran our own. And you can see that the growth rate for the, the blue, top blue one here is the um, Cornish cross male is much faster than the female. Uh, and the ranger comes in, you know, a, a, a close third, but the dual purpose breeds, um, there wasn't really a lot of difference between them, but we had to take them well out into 12 weeks in order to get the same weight as we would have gotten with uh, the other three. So you can see that um, they are a much slower growing bird. Uh, and some people will pay for that because they're closer to sexual maturity. And um, at sexual maturity, they're starting to put on more of the flavor. So, you know, people always say everything tastes like chicken. Well, that's because chicken doesn't taste like much of anything. And um, 
the weights are in grams. Um, yes, the weights are all in grams. Uh, in research here, we always use metrics. Sorry, I should have converted them to to um, pounds, but yes, they're all in grams. Um, so uh, with, with them closer to sexual maturity, they have more of a actual chicken flavor so that uh, they're not being harvested so young where it doesn't have much of a flavor. And the flavor in any chicken dish is basically from the sauce that you add to it. So the, the, um, the heritage type breeds have more of a um, flavor to them. And some people like that. Some people don't like them at all, but uh, some people like that. So if you can get um, value for them, then you know if you can get the right price, that's the way to go. Okay, so um, a lot of times that you know you see chickens sold as free-range chickens, it's important to remember that chicks are unable to maintain their body temperature for the first few weeks. So unless it's really warm out and you're in Florida, uh, you're unlikely to be able to put chicks on pasture. Uh, at day of age. They only have down feathers. They don't have the regular feathers that are much more able to insulate. So uh, required, uh, usually indoors. So um, you have some options. Um, you can use a heat lamp if you have the electricity available. Um, I recommend the red heat lamps because then you don't have 24 hours of light all the way time, all the time that you are raising the chickens in the brooding area. They do come in, um, you cannot put them out in Florida. Okay, well, I have seen it done in Kentucky where they have, in our hot weather, have put out chicks day of age outside uh, and still had a reasonable hatch, but it has to be, um, you know, really warm weather out to be able to do that. Um, and a lot of chicks, cause they're gonna pile up. But uh, most of the year they um, brood them inside and uh, they use a heat lamp. Um, and as I said, if you have white, you then you have 24 seven light. Uh, with the red one, you're just having the heat and, um, you're not having that constant light on, which can be an animal welfare issue uh, to have it 24 seven light. So the red um, is a little bit better. Um, and then you can also use propane, which is the, the one in the, the left there. Um, whatever you use, make sure that, you know, you are careful that you don't set anything on fire. Uh, a lot of poultry houses burn down because of improper use of heat lamps, make sure that they're in a uh, ceramic socket um, and properly suspended so that they don't fall down and uh, set the place on fire. You also have to remember that the heat lamps especially only heat down so that um, you are not heating the, the room, you're heating the chicks. Um, that way uh, you are um, you know, you're just heating. It, although the the cap is to try and um, to keep it the heat the downwards. So uh, we recommend using a brooder guard. Uh, this is a commercial facility uh, from when I was in Minnesota, and no, they didn't put chicks outside in Minnesota. <laughs> um, so the brooder guard serves three functions. It keeps the chicks near the heat source, uh, it keeps out drafts, and it eliminates corners so that the chicks can pile up and um, suffocate the ones underneath. So. The ch chicks are free to come and go as they please with the, the heat to keep themselves uh, the way they want. So um, recommend the, the brooder guards. Uh, this is another 
for Minnesota. And the, it is rounded here, so it's not a square edge. You can't quite see it. Uh, they have used a box with a heat um, for the, the um, chickens. They can go in and out of that area um, to keep warm. In terms of feeders, um, usually you get some chick feeders. You can get the, the long ones or you can get the circular ones. Um, Water is the same thing. You can get nipple drinkers. Uh, nipple drinkers tend to be um, less of a mess than the, the quartz ones. Um, less water spillage goes on with them. Chicks can learn from day one to use the nipple drinkers or the waterers, whichever one you want, um, but you should use the same concept all the way through. So we always recommend teaching the chicks to use whatever you have. So with the nipple drinkers, just simply putting their um, beak up and activating the nipple will teach them that's where the water is. Um, and then dipping them in a, a source if that seems to be the, uh, the way you're gonna go with the waterers. So teaching them to drink is most effective. Once you get the chicks, if they're being shipped, whether it's by mail or you're going to pick them up, chicks bring in their yolk sac right before they hatch. And so they can survive for 48 hours without food. But uh, as soon as you get them, they really need water first. So make sure you give them the water first and then you can um, put on the, the feed. So this is a, an indoor production facility, again in Minnesota, same place. And you'll see that chi you know, chickens, even broost, broilers like to roost. Uh, so you gotta watch out for that so that they don't all roost and bring down the, the, um, the watering system. They've continued with the nipples. I don't like that they don't hang their feeders so they get a lot of feed wastage. Um, going on so that's going to cost them more with that they also have a, this particular facility also has a really bad uh, method for storing feed and so they had a rodent problem rodents can bring in disease as well as you know just salmonella in general and uh, if you're processing and selling and you testing positive for salmonella you could get shut down so um, you know make sure that you you know, store your feed properly and hang your feeders up. Uh, they should be the level with the back of the chicken so that they can uh, access the feed without making that much uh, feed wastage. Uh, this is our outdoor facility that we used. Uh, you can see we put our broilers out relatively early. We have the feeder which uh, it, is hung up. Um, they're quite small right now, so it will get raised as they get older. And the bucket um, has nipple drinkers underneath it, and um, we can put the water through the hole in the top of the bucket to keep it full. And again, we raise it. With, what, with nipple drinkers, you want it so that they have to reach up to get the water. Uh, chicks can't swallow like we do. They use gravity to get the water down. So if you watch a bird drink, they'll dip their, their beak in water and then lift their head up and let the water trickle down the back of their throat. So um, by having it so they reach up, they're already having that uh, gravity going on. So this was our pens that we used for uh, our outdoor trial. and. Um, they are movable and uh, the amount of time you move them depends on um, the uh, type of chicken and the growth rate. Um, so the question is what's the space requirement for outdoor facilities? A lot of that depends on what type of chicken, uh, how much you're growing it to and um, how often you move the pens. So, um, this type of, this pen was 10 feet by 10 feet, and um, they say you can put 100 in there. We didn't put 100 in there. I wouldn't put more than 50 in there. 
um, with the broiler type. Um, the more you put in, the more you move, you have to move them. Um, and you base it, you know, on how much space you have available. So I would, uh, outdoor space also depends on your forage that you have, if you want to utilize forage. So, um, yeah, it depends. It can be anywhere from two to three square feet per chicken um, for the outdoor area. This is another facility. This one was in, um, uh, was this Minnesota or Kentucky? I can't remember. Um, I think this one was Minnesota. Um, and you can see these are, these are the Salatin type pens that Joe Salatin uses in Virginia. I do not like these particular pens. One, they're too, too short. Two, they have metal roofs and uh, most places that you know have a hot sun, you're basically baking your chicken underneath. Um, and you can see he has put quite a lot of birds in there. <clears throat> you try to move them every day or every other day, depending on how big they are. And broilers don't move as easily as the other birds. Um, the, the heritage and the red rangers tend to move easier than um, the, the Cornish cross. They're just bred to you know, eat and grow. So that's one system. And you can see their watering system. They have a bucket, that bucket feeds a waterer uh, on the ground. <clears throat> and uh, can't remember what they had for feeders. Can I see? Probably trough feeders. And you can see that their, their grass, I think, is a little bit too tall, which I'll talk about in a minute. OK, so uh, even if the birds are raised outside, they need a complete feed. Uh, this is especially important while you're brooding them. Um, they formulate the diets based on the energy content of the diet. Energy content will determine how much feed they'll eat. And so they formulate it to have the right amount of protein with uh, the correct amino acids and the right vitamins and minerals in it so that when they eat the amount of feed that they will with that energy, it will meet all of their nutritional requirements. So this is especially important during the brooding phase get them off to a good start, good immune system going. <clears throat> and uh, one of the questions I get asked a lot is how much nutrition do they get from the pasture? So if you're outside with the pasture, um, you have to remember that um, there are basically two types of methods for re releasing nutrient from a feed. There is the digestion by chemical, processes that happens in us, it happens in chickens, uh, it happens in all monogastrix, that is single stomach uh, animals. There is also digestion by microbial fermentation, and this is uh, particularly the case with um, ruminants. So ruminants have a big microbial vat that has a lot of uh, fermentation going on that breaks down the feed. Um, and then releases the nutrients that, that can be uh, taken in. The cell walls of um, plants can have a very hard, uh, lignant, indigestible cell wall. It can be broken down by those, that microbial fermentation, but is not broken down by the chemical um, enzymatic processes in the chicken or the human. Um, mainly because it's made of cellulose instead of starch. We can easily digest starch, chickens can easily digest starch. They're not very good at cellulose. And although, um, whoops, where are we? Although the cellulose and starch are chemically very similar, it is this bond, uh, where are we? Come on, how come you're not working? Okay, there's a bond between the, the glucose molecules and in starch, it goes one way and in cellulose, it goes a different way. And our enzymes 
in our bodies and in the chickens can digest the starch bonds, but they can't digest the cellulose bonds. The enzymes from the microbes can digest the cellulose, which is why chickens can use starch and cows can use cellulose. Oh, there we are. So this bond here is uh, in starch is easily digested by us and chickens, whereas the cellulose bond is not. So the amount of um, nutrition that a chicken can get from pasture depends on the pasture. Oh, come on, why aren't you working? So um, as I said, this is the ruminant stomach with the big vat that um, does all that enzymatic breakdown. Chickens do not have that. They do have two cica at the, these are the blind pouches at the end of the digestive tract, and it will break down some of the, um, the cellulose type uh, products because it does have microbes there, and it will release some um, vitamins, which will retrograde travel back up a little bit, so you can absorb some of it, but not a lot of it, so uh, you don't get a lot of it, it from back there, the, the, the um, cow, uh, horses are a hindgut fermenter as well, but they get more from it. And rabbits will uh, excrete the, the cica and then eat it. So they use coprophagy to get the nutrition from the cica. Um, chickens don't tend to do that as much. Um, and so they don't get a lot from the pasture. And if you, one of the things that's important is the, um, the type of chicken. So this is uh, our pens again after we have moved the pens. And you can see the difference. Um, the close one here where the, the, it's almost brown, that it had the uh, heritage type chickens in it. And they stripped the, the leaves off of all of the forage and then you know pooped on all the stems the next one above them had broilers in it and you can see they did not uh, consume very much of it at all so you can tell which pens had the heritage breeds in them and which ones did not so type of chicken will also be important how much they will eat of that pasture is important and you'll also see that uh, this was actually an alfalfa field and we have it cut so that it's fresh growth that the chickens had on pasture. So um, the amount of nutrition that they can get will depend on the types of plants that you are uh, using in your pasture as well as the age of the, the um, the, the pasture crop. So if it starts to get really old, um, you're getting more of that cellulose and lignin and hemicellulose that we can't, that, that, that chickens can't digest, but the fresh stuff, they'll get more nutrients from it. So some of the research, not our research, some of the other published research says that they can get anywhere from five to 10% of their nutritional requirements from the pasture, but it depends on the type of chicken, the type of pasture crops, and how you manage the pasture. So all those things come into play. If you don't, if you are not using high densities, but um, if you're using some of the other ones and growing them longer, coccidiosis can become a problem. The picture on the left is a chicken with normal poop for, for a chick. Um, and coccidiosis is a parasite, it's a protozoan. Um, it's pretty much everywhere. Uh, different species affect different uh, bird animals. So uh, Cows get coccidiosis, for example, but the coccidia from cows do not affect chickens. Rabbits can get coccidiosis, but the coccidia from rabbits don't affect chickens. So, and even the ones from chickens don't affect turkeys. But you can see here that you know, the life cycle, and they will 
uh, grow, mature, and produce an oocyst, which is then released into the litter with the, the, the poop. Um, the oocyst has to become infective, and you usually need a, uh, you know, the correct environmental conditions so that, you know, if, it, if you keep your bedding dry, then the oocysts do not sporulate and then cannot become infective. But what ha usually happens is you get a water spill in an area and that, you know, all those oocysts that have been sitting there suddenly sporulate and can become infective and you start getting uh, problems with the chickens. So, um, you know, they can take anywhere from a week to a year. They can stay in that site, no problem. Uh, and then suddenly you get a water spill and suddenly you're having a bloom of uh, coccidiosis. So um, you have to watch out. If you manage them properly, coccidiosis should not be a problem. Uh, necrotic enteritis is another problem of the uh, digestive tract. It's caused by Clostridium perfringens, which is a bacteria that's everywhere. It's in the soil. So, you know, if you get a disruption, disruption in the digestive tract from something like a coccidiosis, you could get an outbreak of necrotic enteritis. So one you know, a subclinical problem with coccidiosis can lead to a bacterial infection, uh, which can cause, you know, the death of your flock. So you have to be careful about that. So some of the risk factors for necrotic enteritis, if you're, you know, handling them poorly, if you have mycotoxins. Mycotoxins are produced from mold. So uh, even if you remove the moldy material, the mycotoxins can stay behind. So you have to watch out for that. Uh, if you don't have proper sanitation, if you have a protein deficient diet, if you're overcrowded, as I said, if you have a coccidiosis infection, um, if you have really high levels of non-starch polysaccharides, uh, which are in a number of different crops, uh, you can, if you have a high level of fish meal, or trypsin inhibitors like sweet potatoes, uncooked sweet potatoes. Um, if they suddenly eat, you know, if they've been protein deficient and then you give them a lot of meat, that can cause it. Uh, anything that causes stress can uh, suppress the chick's immune system and cause them to, you know, succumb to the necrotic enteritis. And if you're selling the chicken, you have to be very careful about what, um, products of any you use to treat them with. Merrick's disease uh, is another problem, um, more so with the, the dual purpose type breeds. You get a paralysis basically because you get an inflammation of the sciatic nerve uh, in the, the legs there and they become paralyzed. Um, it's called the range disease because it happened mostly when chickens were on range, but uh, when we moved them indoors, we sort of got rid of that. We also have a vaccine for it, but you have to vaccinate in the hatchery once they've been outside. It's usually too late to do it. So the best way to deal with all these problems is to have disease prevention especially if you want to raise organically because you can't use most of the medications that we would use uh, for other you know for non-organic type things so a biosecurity program is essential and we do have a webinar on biosecurity basically it's a system to keep out other uh keep out diseases from your flock so not having you know, visitors that have chickens of their own, uh, or a parrot, even a parrot can bring things. Um, prevent the chick's exposure to temperature ex extremes. So anything that causes uh, heat stress can increase the pH, which changes the Clostridium perfringens counts. So a cold stressed chicken can uh, end up getting necrotic enteritis. Properly store all your poultry feeds in a 
sealed container, um, a garbage can, a metal garbage can with a lid seal on it. Make sure that you're not getting any rodents into it. Make sure that you inspect it daily so that there's no mold, um, so that there's no bugs growing in there. Uh, use relatively low stocking density. So, you know, they say one square foot per bird, you know, make it one and a half, make it two. Uh, you don't want too much, but you know, make sure that you're not crowding them in. Use proper uh, nutrition, so use the complete feed. Uh, you can also supplement with yeast extracts, which are considered a prebiotic. So um, they sort of uh, attract the bad stuff and wash it out. Or you can use a probiotic, which is good bacteria that you feed to them to maintain a healthy gut environment. So those are some of the ways that you can help prevent having the problem. Uh, there are a number of resources available online. I really like this uh, particular page. It's a poultry DVM. They have cases that they've looked at. Uh, they have a lot of cool information. Uh, and what I really like is the symptoms uh, checker tool that you see here in the top right hand corner. And uh, it goes through, if you can look by what types of symptoms whoops, you have and uh, come up with some possible um, pro you know, causes of the problem. Um, I, it does not take place of you know, seeing a veterinarian, if you can find one that has anything to do with poultry, uh, or if you're having, you know, a high mortality to get a uh, necropsy done at your state diagnostic lab. Most states do have a uh, diagnostic uh, lab that can give you a good diagnosis, um, but not all people can afford it. Um, so, yeah, prebiotics can be yeah food for food for the probiotics, the good bacteria. Uh, if you have a prebiotic and a probiotic that work together, you have a symbiotic. Um, but they also some of the yeast extracts also attract and carry it through. So they work. It depends on what your prebiotic is as to how it functions. Um, there are different kinds of prebiotics. Um, so those are the I, I like that if you're you know. Check it out, get yourself educated, and then you can talk to a veterinarian uh, about, or your extension agent about what you think the problem might be. Oops. Uh, here are some uh, resources. Our extension website, poultryextension.org. We have articles. We have our upcoming and past uh, webinars. And uh, the Ask an Expert has now been changed to Ask Extension. It's sort of Ask an Expert 2.0. Uh, and we also have a Facebook page uh, where we, I post um, you know, upcoming events uh, from other universities as well as our own. So Penn State has a series coming up on you know, beginner, beginner stuff. Um, Michigan sometimes has some stuff. Uh, Minnesota has some stuff. Uh, I don't know if Wisconsin does rent, Ron, I haven't seen anything, but if you let me know, I can post it there as well. Um, I post news articles, you know, when we had the Newcastle outbreak in um, California, or avian influenza in North Carolina, South Carolina, uh, while we were dealing with COVID. So, um, Lots of resources available for you. Stop sharing. And let's see if I can get my chat box back. Q&A back. Oops, come on guys. Very, there you are. So there was one comment here. Um, I own a USDA butcher shop in Michigan. We both retail and wholesale. I see the trend of heritage birds in a big way. One issue I come across is that many people are disappointed with the breast size in heritage birds after purchase. 
even though the flavor is often better. Some something to keep in mind, we are careful to explain this at the time of sale, which seems to be effective. Yes, you have to make sure that you explain your product because uh, yeah, the heritage chickens definitely don't have as much breast meat. Uh, if they like the dark meat, you know, this, the thighs and, and drumsticks are, are really good and they're more flavorful. They have that chicken flavor, but um, they are familiar with the chicken in the grocery store. So, um, the, you know, you need to explain, you need to educate people where chicken comes from. <laughs> Uh, any thoughts on growing Cornish cross broilers slower by feeding them less? I wouldn't, yeah. There are a few growers around here that do this. They claim they do more foraging. Uh, Cornish are not great at foraging. They will to some degree if you, you know, you starve them. Um, they like to just sit and eat. Um, typically what they do, especially early in the commercial operations, is they give them uh, less light, so they don't give them the 24-7 light. Um, by having them um, have less light, they eat less during that early growing, so um, they're not as hungry because they can't see the feed. If they see the feed, they want to eat it. So yes, you can grow them slower, um, but by having a limited amount of feed, uh, but you have to be careful that you don't have a nutritional deficiency that results. So if your pasture is not providing the, the amount that's missing, then you're going to have all sorts of disease issues going on because feeds are formulated based on how much the chicken is going to eat to get all the vitamins and minerals that they require. So, you know, giving them, um, Less feed will slow them down, um, but it can have side effects if you're not if it's not done properly. So, um, I hope that answers the question. Uh, any more questions? I think I got everybody's question while I was doing it. Um, yeah. If you have. Um, a topic that you don't see a webinar for and would like to see, feel free to email me and let me know what that topic is and I will make sure that we get it. Um, the webinar that we did on poultry processing uh, was somebody requested it and so we uh, we put it together and, and got it for them. So um, if you have a topic, um, we're putting on, we're, right now we're putting together next year's topics already, so um, we're trying to uh, find speakers for our list of topics, including um, some of the mycotoxin problems, as well as, um, you know, plants to avoid in pasture because of, you know, poisonings or anything like that. So, um, anyone have any more questions or comments that they would like. We have seven minutes if you would like. Uh, can you please view the second to last study again, the one with the poultry exam diagnostic tool? Okay, let me share my screen again. Share and second to last. This one? Oh, I gotta get my chat box back. Where's the chat box? Yes, this one is the, if you just go to poultrydvm.com, uh, it, it has all this stuff. So if you, if I go to the previous one, it's the same. It's the, the um, chicken symptom, symptom checker tool that they have up there they have you know they go through various cases in home you know backyard flocks on chicken cases as well as duck cases if you're into ducks uh, they have a variety of uh, you know fancy infographics to teach you about different things um, they can 
if you're uh, into environment enrichment, um, they have that there too. So uh, they have quite a bit of information that they have. Uh, I did on the Facebook post a list of toxic plants and I got it from here. They do have a link to toxic plants. They do have predators. We did a webinar on predators as well um, from across the country. Unfortunately, we didn't get Hawaii, but uh, we did get from west coast to east coast of continental um, uh, America to discuss some of the different types of predators that are available and how to deal with them. Um, so that is one. Um, Thing to look at as well so yeah we have a lot of webinars that we have done over the years and we the, everything gets recorded everything gets posted uh, you can um, do the ask an expert so if I uh, switch to where share screen Ooh. I go here and go here. So this is our uh, homepage for our um, small and backyard poultry. And uh, we have uh, webinars. So we have our upcoming webinars. The next one is November 4th and it deals with um, the handling and cooking of turkey, getting ready for Christmas but you can see that we have a whole slew of them. They're organized by topics. So the, the most interesting exhibition chickens, which was really good. Uh, this one was the predator one, um, managing egg laying slaughter. We'd, we've done uh, when they implemented the new regulation where now small flock guys can't go to the grocery, go to the feed store and buy antibiotics. We have biosecurities, uh, we have avian influenza, different things about nutrition. We have the behavior, science, food safety, management, housing, different rules and regulations, uh, some things for youth programs. And then we did some short uh, series on you know, getting started. Um, what to think about before you get chickens and all that kind of stuff. So we have a lot there for people to, to look at. So uh, I hope you will check us out. Let me stop sharing. So I have three minutes left on our timing. Does anybody have any more comments or questions? Well, seeing none. Oh, where do we go? Okay, thank you for your time. <laughs> thank you, Matt. Thanks, Ron. Um, so hopefully I'll see you here next month and we'll learn all about buying turkey for Thanksgiving and how to properly cook it. So um, I will stop the recording.